And it's uh, 12.55. We're now streaming live on the internet. Thank you. And Vice Chairperson Ellenberg, I see you've joined us as well. Would you like to do a microphone test? Hey there, Colin. How are you today? Doing good. I can see you and I can hear you. So we are good. Thank you. And Valerie, I see you've joined us as well. Would you like to do a microphone test? Hi, everyone. Good morning. Valerie Smith. I can see you and I can hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Ignacio, I see you've joined us. Would you like to do a microphone test? Good afternoon. I can hear you. Thank you very much. And Alania, I see you've joined us as well. If you'd like to do a microphone test. Good afternoon. I can hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then we got a couple minutes left until the meeting starts. If there's anyone that has not done a microphone test that wishes to do so, go right ahead. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, Supervisor Chavez. How are you? Good. Nice to see you. It's great to see you too. All right. Well, I think we're recording all in progress. For. Um, and I will now begin our Children's Seniors Families Committee meeting for Wednesday, um, the 21st of December. And as uh, I will ask our clerk to call the roll. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg. I'm here. And Chairperson Chavez. Here. Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, and we're going to go to item two, and this is a public comment, and this is an opportunity to speak to an item that is not on the agenda, but within the purview of this committee. Okay, uh, we do have two requests to speak, Madam Chair. Thank you, and we'll give them two minutes each. Okay, please just give us a moment to get the timer up. Thank you. Okay, and our next speaker is Kathleen King. You will have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. The timer will begin when you begin speaking. Thank you. This is Kathleen King from Healthier Kids Foundation. I hope. Oh. oh, yeah, we can hear you, Kathleen. Go ahead. Oh, I think she's muted again. Uh, maybe we can restart the timer for Kathleen. I think it's on mute now. There you go, okay. Kathleen. Okay, thanks. It's Kathleen King from Healthier Kids Foundation. I know it's the holiday season, but I am extremely worried about our children. Uh, you know, we all know they suffered educationally with the pandemic, but but the physical effects, I think, are huge. Um, and we just can't even keep up with the need. We've already screened 10,000 children this year for dental. And before the pandemic, our referral rate was 30%. It's now 40%. And in some schools, in Alum Rock, Luther Bank, Burbank, and Franklin McKinley, it's over 50% referral rate. It's not any better for zero to five, zero to five, 3,000 screens so far this year, 42% referral rate. And the surprise also was vision. Vision has always run about 14% for us. It is now 36% higher at 19% mm. and 19% for zero to five-year-olds as well which is always a surprise when the zero to fives have as high a risk as the zero to 18. We also in the, those were our big surprises. The other big surprise was that our universal wellness screening didn't get a whole lot better so far this year. We're at 56% of what we've screened last year and the need is about 3% lower. But those that are at imminent risk or need um, school protocol right away is running around 3%. Last year, it was 2%. And that was 58 children where the crisis mobile unit was called or the emergency school protocol had to be used. So I, as I was hoping things were going to get better, they're not getting better. And it's, it's just a real setback. We will hit 500,000 services in January and about 10,000 pairs of glasses. Thank you. And our next speaker is Blair Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please go ahead. Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, thanks for the meeting today. I just wanted to thank uh, Count, uh, Supervisor Ellenberg that um, I've been reading her tweets on, on child care services for you know children under five and the importance of that and how to really be inclusive and bring people in to that sort of thinking uh, for our future to develop good, uh, you know, pre five uh, programs for the future of Santa Clara County. It's been really nice to read. And uh, I don't know, it just it's given me hope. It's given me a uh, good feelings how to how to talk with county. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I also wanted to offer that um, you know, it is, it's fairly important to me, the future of open accountability practices. And I, I, I've tried to offer a few times the importance of what uh, offering a few uh, words or sentences in the future of closed meeting session items to describe what closed meeting session items are about in the future. I mean, beyond uh, just the current issues that you're having with accountability, I just think overall, I mean, I, I started talking to, to you about these issues before, uh, you know, the, the issues that Dr. Smith arose, 
that it's just good accountability practices for ourselves. And I just really hope that you can take that to heart and want to uh, develop those sort of closed session uh, uh, writings for public agendas in the future that most Bay Area cities already do that Santa Clara County has had a major problem in, in wanting to do. I don't know why that is. Uh, just a reminder here, uh, hopefully you can work towards those goals uh, in our future. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much. I'm going to come back uh, to uh, Susan and I to look at the consent calendar and changes to the agenda. Uh, so let me walk through what I'd like to propose uh, for consent. And then um, what I'll do, Susan, is I'm going to walk through the items for consent. And then I'm going to um, make some comments just so you can, it'll give you a minute to track. This is a two person committee, so we can't get super deep <laughs> outside. So, um, and also just as a reminder to staff, when we put your items on consent, it's often because the report is very clear and we're grateful for the work that you're doing. And um, it's, it's not for lack of interest. So I would like to add item four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 12, 16, and 17 to consent. So that's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 12, 16, and 17. And, and for item 10, I just wanted to alert the staff that I, I really have one question for item 10, which is why I would like to keep it on the um, agenda. And that it really is to take a, to get from staff's perspective, why we see the increase in, um, in services needed for victims of child abuse. So just that one question. So if you have other staff that don't need to uh, be here to respond to that, I will promise to keep my questions centered there. So for item four, this is the 2023 legislative priorities report. Again, I wanna thank staff for its clarity. Item five is the first five annual report. Again, well done and clear. Item six is a report on the status of the welcoming center. I wanna appreciate that staff um, has a work plan and a timeline so everyone can understand what next steps are gonna be needed as we move this project forward. I understand that DFCS um, space request for review has been approved by the space committee and that real estate is now working with central services to identify to or negotiate leases for um, a new welcoming center. As appropriate, please keep both Supervisor Ellenberg's office and my office um, apprised of how this moves forward. Item seven is the out of home placement report and appreciated the, the detail on why um, there were changes. So had, the analysis was helpful. Item eight is the 2021-2022 older adult summit report. Thank you for that, it was very informative. Item nine is a report reflecting services to transitional age youth, including the universal ba basic income report. And regarding that component of it, the um, California's guaranteed income pilot and our UBI program, which State Senator Cortez has played a key, key leadership role in establishing, I understand our county's application for the state's program was denied. As a reminder, we approved as part of the recent budget process, one-time funding for 50, transitional age youth to participate in the program beginning January, I'm sorry, June 1st, 2023, as staff continues to look for other funding sources to and to expand the eligibility pool, including foster high school seniors. I wanna emphasize that when this comes back in January to the full board, that I would like it to have a revised proposal and funding options for the board, or just being clear that, that um, you know what the staff's recommending so that the board has an opportunity to determine whether or not it should be included in the mid-year or June budget process. And I do just want to say to the staff working on this program, thank you for your resiliency. You have really been remarkable. Item 12 is the Adult Protective Services Report and the Home Safe uh, Report. Thank you for that information. Item 13 is the Tobacco Settlement Revenue Report, and I'd like to have this money clearly called out in the recommended budget, including the, the basis for the administration's recommended use of funds. 
Item 16 is a report relating to the recruitment and retention of the transgender, non-binary, and gender expansive employees, applicants, and contractors. And I want to thank staff for their work on this report and request a progress update to this committee in March. I'd like the report to also include a plan for e from ESA relating to the implementation of the recommendations in, in the trans employment study that fall under the human resources purview, such as connecting co county departments and agencies to available LGBTQ and workplace cultural competency training, promoting self audit tools and offering more support and resources to connect trans and non-binary job seekers to jobs. Um, and the report should include information from county council and the administration about the status of the administration's, uh, the administrative gender inclusive, inclusion policy that has been under review by county council. Item 17 is a report relating to options for housing and childcare for survivors of gender-based violence. I would like to thank the staff and service providers for their continued work and request a progress report to this committee in March with the work plan with clearly defined objectives and projected timelines. Those would be my comments on the areas that I put on consent. Supervisor Allenberg. Thank you. I think I followed all of that, but was did you put 13 was that on your list yes the tobacco settlement i actually have some questions uh, so i'd like to keep that on the regular agenda no problem uh, the rest are fine i just want to make a quick comment about item eight um pull that up um I, at first, I, I'd like to confirm that this report will be uh, forwarded on to the Senior Care Commission for their review and consent. And uh, if, if there's a quick answer, I'm interested to know if there's an overall program coordination so that older adults have a single source where they can look to find all of the programs that, that are available. And if that's a longer answer, happy to get that in an off-agenda explanation. Can staff respond to that? or would you prefer an off agenda? Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Chavez and Supervisor Ellenberg. Um, I think we'll go ahead and uh, respond to that in an off agenda. Okay, great. And, and will it be um, forwarded to the Senior Care Commission? Is that part of the process? Uh, let me follow up on that and I can certainly address that as part of the written report. Perfect, thanks Sherry. Thank you. I'm happy then to make a motion to adopt the consent calendar with amendments and verbal direction. Excellent. We have a motion and a second, and I will now um, take public comment on the consent calendar. Okay. We do have one request to speak, so please give us a moment to get the timer up. Our next speaker is Sparky Harlan. I am unmuting you. Please go ahead. Yes, Sparky, uh, we have unmuted you. Uh, Sparky, you. you're not unmuted on your end. If you're trying to talk, we can. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, there you I go. There you seem go. to be un unstable for me. Um, I just wanted to speak. I'm I'm unstable. My internet connection. Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay. Hopefully it will hold on. Um, I just wanted to speak to item nine on the transition age youth in the hub. Um, I wanted to say how much we've enjoyed working with the county this past year, two years through COVID and with the hub services and did want to point out that we hadn't had an increase since 2018 for funding for the hub. Um, but after the recent incident at the hub this past summer, uh, we met with social services director and talked about adding some staff, including a mental health specialist, which I believe will be coming to the board next month. And did want to say I appreciate that. I think having a mental health specialist attached to the hub will really improve services to our um, foster youth, especially with behavioral health problems. 
So just wanted to bring that up and thank the department for working with us to bring in those services. Thank you. And that concludes our speakers. Thank you very much. So we have a motion and a second. Okay. And just to make sure I have everything, that would be items four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, twelve. 16 and 17 with 13 to be kept on the regular agenda, correct? That's correct. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, Vice Chairperson Ellenberg? Yes. And Chairperson Chavez? Yes. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna now go to item 10 and this is the Youth Center for Evaluation and Advocacy. Um, this item, um, I, I really just wanted to, uh, first, I, I just appreciate uh, the teamwork on bringing these issues forward, but I was hoping someone could just spend a moment talking to us a little bit about the increased um, numbers that are that we're seeing in our community. The chart has from 2017 to November 22 in it, and I wondered if somebody could respond and just give us their their perspective on why we're seeing such a significant increase. Is there anybody here from the Child Advocacy Center? Hi, Supervisor Chavez, I will have to get that information back uh, to you. I was not prepared to um, respond for CAC today. Thank you. Perhaps, um, who is the leadership there? Who would normally be the person who could respond to that question? Well, our medical director of the Child Advocacy Center is Dr. Marlena Sturm. Uh -huh. And then um, I am the director of primary care. So that cl the, cl the clinic part falls under me. And then of course, it's a collaboration with the DA and other services. So um, I'm looking here and I do not see Dr. Smith. And Supervisor Chavez, I am on and I was just trying to send a message to see if I could get you the answer to that. Let me, um, if it would be possible to just go on to the next item, I can see if we can um, get someone on to answer your question, which is what I was trying to do just yeah. now. Yeah, Greta, what, I, what I'm going to recommend is why don't we just um, continue this item to our next meeting and let's be prepared to answer that question. And also, uh, Greta, what my my hope would be that the that we learn a little bit more about um, the like kind of who, who's the lead in each of these areas so that we do have somebody that has that kind of integrated knowledge prepared to respond to the board for each of the sections because my other concern has always been that we wrap these three reports together and I think that that may actually have an impact as well but let's continue the item and let's have a conversation about it in the in the new year but if that's okay that way yeah that's no absolutely fine around. And appreciate you um, giving us time to bring back a more complete response. Thank you. Thank you. And so we'll make a. I'll make a motion to continue item ten to our first meeting in January. Second then. Thank you. Can I ask for a roll call vote because I see no hands raised from the public. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg. Yes. And Chairperson Chavez. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's move on to item eleven, the hub. Good afternoon, Chairperson Chavez and Vice Chair Ellenberg. I am going to hand over the presentation to Natalie Monk. Thank you, Consuelo. I will share my screen. All right. Uh, so county staff continues to partner with Allied Housing on the development of 1510 and 1540 Parkmore Avenue to co-locate the hub in affordable housing. Allied is pursuing streamlined entitlements under SB 35 and anticipates that entitlements will be complete in January. The San Jose City Council will vote on formally approving their funding commitment to the residential portion of the project on January 31st. Allied plans to submit an application for 4% tax credits on February 7th. Uh, since our last report, 
OSH and SSA have co-hosted the last two workshops in the five-part workshop series to receive input from the Tay community on the new hub and housing. Uh, we're trying to reach a broad spectrum of stakeholders in the Tay community, and this slide shows the range of individuals and organizations we've been reaching out to. On October 20th, OSH and SSA co-hosted workshop number four, Hub Art and Murals. The meeting began with a review of the project's background and recent updates and a summary of how we've incorporated previous feedback into the current design. Allied Housing then facilitated a visioning session where participants provided input on the types of art, artistic themes, and specific ideas for metal screens and interior signage. Key takeaways from this workshop included ensuring that all art is culturally inclusive and reflects the youth, spe uh, specific ideas for visual elements and themes, uh, and that Tay are interested in participating in making art for the new hub. On November 16th, OSH and SSA co-hosted workshop number five, Housing. In keeping with the previous workshops, uh, the workshop included recent updates and a summary of how we've incorporated previous feedback. OSH gave an overview of the design of the housing portion of the project, the different housing opportunities available at the site, and the factors that we considered in the planning of the proposed housing programs. We also held visioning and feedback exercises where participants provided input on their experience in finding affordable housing, uh, what's most important to them about their housing, and how the hub and the housing can be designed to feel like one community. So key takeaways included the need for Tay to build credit and the difficulty that they face in finding affordable housing, the need for larger units to accommodate families with children, and ideas for community events for both hub users and project residents to help make the development feel like one community. At the final workshop in the five-part series, we also solicited feedback from the Tay community on how they would like to stay engaged. Youth indicated that they would like to have regular updates that they can digest and give feedback on on their own time using digital media. And as a result, county staff is proposing to provide monthly virtual updates and feedback opportunities, and we will also offer additional hybrid workshops as needed. Uh, HKIT, the project architect, has prepared a community engagement report that summarizes the five-part design series, which is included in this report as attachment A. And I will now hand it off to Damian Wright for an update on the existing hub. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Chavez and Vice Chair Ellenberg. Uh, Damian Wright, Assistant Director, DFCS. Uh, as you see on the slide here, uh, there's the current utilization of hub services. Uh, it's fairly in line with uh, our previous fiscal year. There has been an increase in youth engagement and workshops, employment, and use of computers. Youth do appreciate the hybrid of services offered with the flexibility of attending workshops virtually and case management services. Uh, the youth really share that their limit to the, the, the trips to the hub uh, are in respect to their use of uh, the virtual opportunity they have in involving themselves in the workshops and employment exercises. Um, the other piece that I would like to add is the hub just recently celebrated its 11th anniversary, which took place on September 30th, 2022. Uh, the event was inclusive of current and fo former foster youth between the ages of 18 and 24 and alumni. Uh, and with that, we'll conclude our presentation. Thank you very much. I don't see any hands from the public, so I'm going to close the public uh, comment section and go to Supervisor Ellenberg and give a, a, a smile on your face. So I'm going to go with you first and I'll, I'll weigh in. I am so eager for this project to move forward. It, it has been a long time and I know a lot of work. I want to thank uh, staff for the report. Uh, today and for all of the, the good work that's been done with the community engagement process. Uh, with respect to the, the entitlement improvement process, I, I'm curious to know um, whether um, Allied Housing submitted an AB 2162 application that was denied by the city of San Jose or, or was it Allied's um, choice to 
uh, to go with SB 35. Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg, for the question. When we originally connected with the planning department um, in the city of San Jose, um, we thought the project was eligible under um, 2162 because more than 50% of the units were set aside for special needs populations. Right. Um, unfortunately, um, the planner that we spoke to in partnership with Allied didn't understand the complexities of the land use entitlement process where we're subdividing the property, right? So they only looked at the housing portion and didn't take into consideration the hub that the county owned the land, that we were ground leasing it to the developer. Um, and so it wasn't until after when we submitted the pre-application that those conversations really started. So it's a lesson learned for our team and our development partners moving forward. Um, and the pivot to an SB 35 application, while it did delay the project, it actually protects it from a CEQA lawsuit more so than an AB 2162 application, which is why county staff supported the pivot rather than uh, making an argument to continue down the path of AB 2162. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Um, and I know that there's a lot of hard work happening as well um, at the city of San Jose um, in, in those departments. Do they also uh, do they offer assistance in filling out um, the entitlement applications? Do you know? Um, they typically don't. That is for the property owner or the developer in this case to fill out. One of the things that they did do for us was, um, you know, unofficially um, give us an expedited process. Um, there are certain requirements under SB 35. And um, I mentioned to others that we received a soft approval on December 19th. Okay. Um, you know, there's uh, Natalie reminded me that there's some additional documents that we have to receive before we can get excited, but um, everything is lining up so that we can submit the tax credit application in February. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. That that's helpful. So the entitlements all have to be improved, approved before the loans and the tax credits can be approved. Correct? That is correct. That is correct. Thank you. Um, thank you for all of that. And as I learn more and become more more comfortable with the big picture, it's really interesting uh, to understand and see where there are areas for continuous improvement, um, really in the in, on the tactical level. And I'll, I'll just share, I'm certain that you're, you've been reading about this, Consuelo, but of course the Los Angeles mayor, uh, Karen Bass declared a state of emergency to address homelessness. And one of the pieces that really caught my eye is that she issued a very sweeping executive order that aims to significantly speed up the development of 100 of 100% affordable housing by requiring city agencies to finish reviewing applications within 60 days instead of their typical uh, six to nine month process. Do you, do you happen to know if the city of San Jose is talking about this or do you think it's a conversation we might um, initiate with them as, as a strong opportunity for, for partnership and really meaningfully speeding up the construction of, of critically needed housing? That's a, that's a great question, Supervisor Ellenberg. I think we benefit from a smaller um, geographic area or, you know, there's 15 incorporated cities in the county. Um, the city of San Jose is by far ahead of the game in implementing all of the streamlining opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were probably more worried for the smaller cities um, and their ability to, it's, it, it's a function of navigating the entitlement streamlining process that uh -huh. sometimes it actually takes longer than if you follow a traditional pattern because staff is new or staff is unfamiliar. Uh, but we've seen a lot of the cities actually step, step up and if there is no general plan land use amendment needed, we're seeing entitlements come in in 12 months, um, which is rather fast in land use world. The fastest in San Jose has been nine months using an SB 35 application. I mean, Susan, on this front, one thing we can do, like separate of the staff, yeah. is yeah. we can formally make that request to the city in writing. Yeah. And why don't we just do that from this committee? To yeah, I think that's that's important, especially since we've heard concerns from the city about how long it's taking to to build uh, some of the permanent supportive housing units, and of course, a part of that time lag is, is the entitlement. It's interesting that. That Mayor Bass is working on a 60-day 
uh, working toward a 60 day goal and um, it, it would be exciting if we could we could create that here too so i'm happy to work on that with you that's excellent and we can bring a letter to the board for signature you know get everybody's approval sure. for signature sure, sure i think Thank you. um just to follow up on that supervisor allenberg and to consuelo's point you know um one one thing that we know adds a lot of time and there have been a, a number of studies I, I actually the most recent study I, I think the most recent one I've saw seen really was conducted prior to COVID if you know and I'm thinking of the um, Consuelo the center out of Berkeley that has done some analysis and one thing that that I want to just acknowledge is that the second letter should go to the state because the what takes the longest period of time it seems that that we that we could have some impact on is how long it takes to get the tax credits because that that piece adds i think in in the study i was reading it added an average of one year and sometimes multiple okay. years yeah it's so i so i i actually think that the that because of that at a local level we're going to have to think a lot about how we want to resource different types of projects back to the point that Consuelo raised about in what circumstance um, uh, you know where we need cities to collaborate where we need the state to collaborate but that mm -hmm. that hole in the donut is dramatic one year for financing it holds everything else up thank you that's um I didn't realize that and I will also take that to the the state um, homeless task force that's hopefully working us toward a statewide uh, homelessness uh, uh, alleviation plan. So thank you for that knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I can share with um, with you both and those watching that there's multiple points in which a project can be derailed. Um, you know, construction, no project is exempt from construction delays. We see that both in the quote unquote quick build um, and in our permanent construction sites. Um, for instance, one of San Jose's um, developments just down the Civic Center, um, their new interim housing was supposed to open in June and it's it's not open yet because of construction delays and what have you. So that no project is immune from the other factors that we can't control. Um, by far for us, the biggest challenge is the tax credits. Um, I think Natalie, her team, and our relationship and coordination with the cities um, has taken us as far as we can go. Now it really is bottlenecked with the tax credits. So what I'd like to ask, Consuelo, that's incredibly helpful. If you could um, prepare, you know, just some sometime in, in the next month, an, an off agenda report for the board that sort of outlines the issues there, um, I think that will help all of the supervisors be be able to advocate um, with, with our colleagues in the state legislature and to really think about um, how this might be addressed on a policy and, and political level, but having all of the facts at our fingertips would be an important first step. So thank you, thank you so much. It really um, is fascinating and frustrating to hear how many opportunities at how many, uh, how many pain points there are in, in getting housing built. So thanks again. And then if if I may, through the uh, chairperson, uh, one of the other items, and I apologize that I missed at the board meeting, the question related to the feasibility analysis um, that re was requested by the board around um, coordination with school districts. Um, and I think we made a commitment to share that update with you here, if that is appropriate now. Um, I would just ask council, I know it wasn't agendized, but I, I'm fine if council just says, yep, no problem. I, I think it would need to be added to the agenda. You're completely right. Yeah, thank you, Consuelo. Consuelo, can we do it January? Uh, we can, Supervisor. We also do have an off agenda that will be ready um, to send out um, as a backup if you'd prefer to receive it as an off agenda or we can come back in January. Um, if, if you have the off agenda, let's do that. And then what I would say, Consuelo, too, is just alert um, the committee that you think could be most helpful in 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 supporting your efforts. I I mean I know that you're in a million meetings, and so I, if if uh, Hewlett is taking a lead on it, I think that's good too. But let's start with an off agenda, and then we'll 
we'll work back from there. Thank you. Uh, anything else, um, Consuelo or Natalie, anybody else wanted to weigh in or Damien? Susan, you're good. Um, the only thing I wanted to just reemphasize is I really appreciate the outreach to the young folks and I really appreciate how difficult it is to engage them. And I wanna just encourage you to keep doing that and using whatever strategies and incentives we need to use because what I what I am most concerned about obviously is I don't want them to come back to us and be concerned that that we we took a turn that they weren't uh, prepared for and um, Susan one thing that I I'm really interested in doing is just reviewing the project in the first quarter with um, with folks so as you as those meetings come up let me know because I'd like to attend uh, them uh, personally absolutely all right very good. Well, thank you all. And I think on this one, I think it's action. So we'll we'll make a motion to make sure that this comes back to us in first quarter with some updates on the uh, just on how we're continuing to engage folks and to let our offices know when those happen. And I'm very very excited um, to see you know the continued youth engagement plans when we meet next quarter just what that continues to look like would be great and that would be chair, question. chairperson chavez to clarify we currently come to this committee on a bi-monthly are we changing that to a quarterly basis oh that leave it the way it is whenever you're next i'm sorry that's why i'm not supposed to deviate from my notes there you go no we'll see you in february <laughs> see you then thank you and i'll second your motion thanks We'll ask staff for a roll call. Vice Chairperson Lumber. Yes. And Chairperson Chavez. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're now moving to item 13, and this is the tobacco uh, settlement, rev revenue settlement. There you go. Do you want to just ask questions, Susan? I, I would be happy to do that, and I, I want to thank staff for the report, another really um, enlightening addition to my ongoing education here. Um, I, I hadn't been at all aware of the, the what is it called, like the annuity sale, the advance, um, the settlement against the advance. And I'm wondering, the, aside from the tobacco settlement, are there any other sources of revenue or, or settlement payments to the county where future funds have been sold to generate a larger sum uh, for a short-term expense? Good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Chavez and Vice Chairperson Ellenberg. Um, that I am aware of, there isn't another situation where we're currently doing this, but I can confirm um, and, and get back to you in case there are plans to, to do this with other sources of revenue. Yeah, thank you. And, and I would be interested to know just what the, what the thinking is to go this way as opposed to a lease revenue bond or, or other financing structures um, so originally for this project you know it was during the downturn of, of 2007 so mm -hmm. you know there there was the thought that we could shift the risk of um at the same time shift some of the risk of reduced future revenues because they were on the decline so uh, tobacco settlement revenues in 2006 hit a low and they had been declining since uh the start of the decade and so um we would shift the funding to the bondholders and also help us fund the uh seismic project that was needed um to increase the number of beds there uh at vmc and so um the board was aware of you know kind of the cost of doing this mm -hmm. um but you know at the time it was it was decided that it was in the best interest of the county to um, undertake this. And the estimate was 88 million that we would generate. And we actually ended up generating 102 million. So what the board was made aware of was 88 million in funding and around a $300 million loss of revenue from 2026 to 2046. Say that number again, the loss in revenue is how many million? Uh, it would be around 300 million, 312 million is what the board was was told is what we are foregoing yes because we got a lump sum earlier um and so the estimate then was 306 based on the trends 312 
and yeah. now the estimate is closer to 335 325 so that's a significant hit to our budget for for the next 20 years um i would like to have more information in advance of of this budget cycle to understand um, how we might be addressing that gap um, in in revenues, what what other funding sources might replace it, and also since the tobacco settlement has largely gone into um, the health system in, into VMC in particular, we already have this big. Um, Three hundred million dollar. I forget what Dr. Smith calls it. Um, uh, general fund investment, I believe, is what the board. Uh, uh, right. E every year, to and it's delayed to come back yes. because of reimbursements. I vaguely understand that one now. Um, does this effectively double the the need for for cash influxes to the hospital system? Because uh, the, so ahead. it. it so it depends on on how we view it. So it currently the subsidy to the hospital is 318 million, and out of that 318 million, um, it, the numbers for the TSR uh, are 18 million. So you could say 300 million is pure general fund investment, and and the 18 million of it is tobacco uh, settlement revenue. Uh -huh. That gets us to the 318. Right. And so what would happen in 2026 is that we would lose that 18 million, assuming the general fund investment stays the same, uh -huh. um, we would have to make up that gap, like you said. And so uh, the projection is to stay um, around 17, 18 million is, is for revenues from TSR to stay that way. And so when we lose them at, at 2026, um, you know, for the next 20 years after that, we would we will be foregoing you know, around 17, 18 million dollars a year. And so uh, it doesn't, it, it increases, yes, our, our general fund, uh, a need to, to cover that general fund um, whole. Well, I don't want to presume that because that's a board policy decision. It may also mean that the board chooses to direct the hospital system to to make whatever reductions. Yes, um, correct might be necessary so that we don't have that that 17 million dollar gap um, the accounting and the math are absolutely yours and the, the policy ultimately is something that i want the board to have great transparency into so that we can talk about that um, this budget cycle um, and and thank you also for your explanations christian you're it's very very clear um, and uh, and easy to follow when you explain it. So thank you. Um, I suspect that Supervisor Chavez had requested the report um, in response to the very general reference to tobacco settlement funds in the last budget, when the additional fund balance for child health was rolled into that as well was rolled into the overall uh, VMC uh, investment. I believe that there what it, it wasn't even clear if there was a fund balance in that account given yes, the way sir. the budget is pre is presented yes that is correct there was um there was a fund balance that was then transferred during the budget process um to uh the, the to the enterprise fund at at, at vmc yeah so I'm, that reduced the general fund investment need to the hospital it was offset one time right but also Right, and wherever we direct some funds, uh, other other areas are not getting that money. And I'm I'm just very interested in how we continue to improve budget transparency in general, not just in relation to the tobacco settlement funds, um, but but other revenue sources as well. As uh, well, with the agreement of uh, Chair Chavez, this might be a topic to refer to FGOC for more review, or to weave into the board priority session setting session in January. Um, I do think it's important to unpack this uh, prior to the beginning of the next annual budget process. So I will make that motion if that's I'm looking for Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, second. Uh, Absolutely. Will that work? Okay, yeah. terrific. Thank you so much. Christian, thank you. That was really helpful. Yeah. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. I'll request a roll call. 
Vice Chairperson Ellenberg? Yes, you know, I didn't make, I'm so sorry, Camille. Um, my my motion may not have been specific enough because I said to refer it to FGOC for more review or to weave it into the board priority setting session in January. And Supervisor Chavez, do you have a preference between those no. two? No. What, no. I would, what I would say is it's actually an and. Okay. And because, yeah, and, and in part because, um, you know, with FGOC that as you look at the incoming audit options, there are, you know, one of them may be the hospital overall, the budget overall, or some component of it. So I would just put it in both. Okay, then then, then the motion has the and in it, and thank you for that. You bet. Okay, so uh, we'll lead you the roll call vote. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg? Yes. Chairperson Chavez? Yes, thank you very much. We're gonna move on to item 14, and this is the Universal Development Screening Initiative. And I will start to see, um, hello, Michelle and Kelsey. Let me see, uh, Susan, did you want, did you have questions on this or staff, do you have a, a brief report? I have a brief verbal report. If Great, possible. thank you. Great, okay. Good afternoon, Supervisors uh, Chavez and Ellenberg, Michelle De La Calle, Director of the System Integration and Transformation for the Health System. Um, we've given you the pre previous reports and some updates. Um, we have executed a contract with First Five to engage the community partner sites in the core cohort, and the team is looking forward to having that robust cohort um, of sites doing the shared work that supports families across our communities into 2023. Um, we've also provided an update, ri updated written report that intends to clarify the current state of the screening done at the pediatric sites across the county health system and lays out the need to add additional staff over time to ensure the process is standardized and in line with the evidence-based Healthy Steps model. Although we anticipate the full model to take uh, a few years to be fully implemented, the infrastructure and learnings are being spread where feasible across Valley Healthcare sites in real time. Examples include the technical and billing workflows and electronic health record builds. Educational programs will also be extended beyond Telesite where possible and include um, a larger team as well. Um, one of the things to note is that the teams uh, learned from the work that they were doing at Tele and have introduced some primary care behavioral health into the OBGYN sites, um, which helps build up the evidence-based support for families across the continuum of care. Because we know there are workforce challenges in recruitment and retaining behavioral health staff, we'll be concurrently researching other options to mitigate those challenges. Um, space is another uh, confounding factor, and we'll be conducting more detailed space analysis to ensure adequate space is available as we bring on additional sites um, and staff to support the full Healthy Steps model. With that, we have a few of us here to answer any questions that might be um, coming up, and we want to express our gratitude um, for supporting this valuable initiative. So thank you. Great. I'm going to see if there are any comments from the public. I see none, so I'm going to close the public hearing component, and I'm going to go to the board, and I'll start with Supervisor Allenberg. Thank you so much. Michelle, thank you uh, and your team uh, for the report and for executing the contract with First Five uh, since the last meeting and providing that requested feasibility analysis for expansion of integration, integrated physical and behavioral health care uh, to the other VMC pediatric clinics. The analysis and the plan I thought were, were very clear and complete. Uh, what I'd like to, to do at this point is direct that staff proceed with space and RFP planning as reference and build that first year of the three-year staffing plan into the recommendations for the FY23-24 budget. And that would be my notion. So a motion, I'm happy to second that. I I just had one um, one kind of broad question, and I very much apologize if I missed it. Is the um, you know, and I also really appreciated the report that was attached. Is the is the ongoing um, when we measure success of the program? It, is the success going to be? Maybe you could talk just a little bit about, like, if you if you said here are the top three measurements of success, they are blah. I'm looking to uh, Kelsey uh, through the chair to see if she has those off offhand. I know that our partners at UCSF were not able to join us today. Um, 
So Kelsey, you have a chance? Yeah, so Healthy Steps has a number of um, kind of models that we're looking at and it's outlined in the, um, in the report. Um, but, you know, mostly we're looking at increasing the behavioral health encounters for early childhood and then the billing associated with that. What I guess what I here's, yeah, here's what I'm trying to understand. So to me, those are very important objectives. And what I'm, so what I'm trying to seek is, okay, now that we have these objectives aligned, which makes sense, we have a, we want more um, children and families have access to mental health services and we want to be able to bill for them. I totally get that. What I'm curious about is when we look at the outcomes that we intend, the things that we're going to be able to see year five, year, year 10, year 15, what are, what are those top three? I just pulled up the kind of the key roles and activities through this model implementation. And I'm not sure that gets to the, what you're asking. So um, I would recommend we kind of step back and, and provide those three specific outcome measures versus process, me process measures in the implementation. Um, and I can look that for that now. That would be great. No, I so didn't I see them in a... here, which is why I asked. I, I was just asking that. So what would be helpful to me is, um, if we could, when your next report back, when is the next report coming to the to this committee? I, I, I don't have the work plan in front of me. No problem. In the next, in, sure. in the February, March timeframe, I would just sure. be interested in what the, what we anticipate the outcomes, because we're doing this for some specific reasons. One, obviously we want to be able to attest, uh, test what emotional well-being at a much, at, you know, at the earliest possible, um, opportunity but what i was curious about is would we expect to see an increase for the impacted child for example in school days in advancement and you know any of those kind of key indices that we look at for childhood success uh, you know and so anyway if we could get those that would be great and and next first quarter is fine great thank you um with that i think there's no action here Oh, um, Chairperson Chavez, we do have a motion on the floor made by oh, uh, Vice great. Chairperson Ellenberg. Oh, that's right. All right. We have a motion and a second. Would you call the roll, please? Thank you, Camille, for catching that. No problem. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg? Oh, uh, Vice yes. Chairperson Ellenberg? Oh, yeah, thank you. great. Yeah. And Chairperson Chavez? Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right. The next item we have is item 15. And this is a uh, family engagement and healing. And I'm going to turn to, all right, Daniel, I see you. Go ahead. Hey, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Chavez and Vice Chair Ellenberg. Uh, very excited to be here today to share the work that's happening. And um, really excited to be uh, joined by um, our lead Deputy County Counsel, Hillary Kerrigan, who you might recall a few weeks ago, um, her office received a commendation from the board, and it was related specifically to this work. Um, we, your packet should include the full PowerPoint due to time. We'll go through it pretty high level, um, but hopefully leave some time for questions. So um, we go ahead and go to the next slide. So just some background, um, child welfare currently um, has seen a, a decrease in the number of kids in foster care. Um, this is both statewide as well as nationally. So um, you can see a drop of from 51,000 in 2012 to 33,000 in, in, in 2022. So we've seen the trend of a reduction in kids that are being placed in foster care. I think what you'll see here is, is the work that we've done that's kind of significantly impacted that locally for our county. Next slide. So this is a, a graph showing kind of what that uh, what that reduction looks like for us. So um, 2020, we saw uh, kind of a decrease especially the first part of the year, due mostly to the pandemic. We saw the decrease in the calls coming through our hotline, which related to, to less um, emergency response investigations and subsequently less children being put, being put into uh, DSTS care. During this time, we also implemented some practice changes, which I'll highlight a little bit later. Um, and you can see just the significant decrease of the kids that are having to be removed from um, their homes. Um, this doesn't mean that we have less less children and less families receiving services, but we see significantly less children and families where services are required through a foster care prevention system. Next slide. Part of this is that we we understand and recognize the impact of a removal. 
Um, anytime we separate a child from, a uh, from their parents, um, even for a short term, we know that there's an immediate and, and a, it was a long term impact to that uh, to that removal. So, you know, when I was a practicing social worker many years ago, um, often when that when we weren't quite sure, um, we often went with what we thought was the the um, least impactful, which was to put a child in, in foster care if, if we were unsure. We know now that that causes uh, long term harm. So our practice now is to make sure that before we do that separation that we've exhausted um, every other possibility uh, to make sure that that's really the the, the path of uh, the final path we would use uh, for foster care. And some of the refinements that we've seen is, is really a robust use of the child and family team meeting, um, our child and family practice model, our structured decision making, which is the assessment tool that we use that's used statewide, and then increased leadership and support. And I'll go through each of these. So the first thing is a child and family team meeting. Now, this isn't new. Um, the child and family team meeting has been around in some form um, for many years. The difference that we've seen over the last couple of years is how we're engaging families to this process. Um, that instead of being a, a tool to help with case planning after a child's been removed, that really this is our initial engagement with that family. So that the family's driving that initial planning. So if, if we do an assessment, we engage you know, on an investigation, we, had, we determine that there's a safety threat present, we can engage that family through a CFT where that family can help to design their own safety plan. And I think we can all recognize that if a family, if we're involved in making a plan for us, then it's gonna be more likely that it's gonna be successful. So this has been a significant change for us um, to build out the, the CFT resources to make sure that we're doing these child and family team meetings whenever possible before we're, we're uh, removing a child. The next slide. Next piece is the child and family practice model. Again, this isn't a new, a new something new. It's been around for a number of years. Um, I think one of the silver linings of the last couple of years, with especially 2020 with a pandemic, was we saw a little bit of a decrease in workload kind of across the department, which gave us some time to kind of revamp and reinvent some of the practices that we were doing. And the child and family practice model was one of those. The taking the, the philosophy of the family at the center and the family as the expert in their situation and turning it into practice. That goes to the child and family team meeting. So, um, you know, really looking at this, the CFPM and, and asking ourselves, what do we want that to look like for the family um, and actually living that with the family. Next slide. Structured decision making. So this is an evidence based tool that's used in every county um, in California. Um, Santa Clara County was one of the last implementers. Um, we fully implemented SDM um, early 2017, so we're still pretty early on. Um, it's an evidence-based tool that, uh, that has different components. There's a hotline tool. There's a safety tool for our investigators. Um, there's tools to determine when kids can go back home. So really just making sure that we were leaning in on this and, and making proper use of the definitions that it was guiding our decision-making. Um, and again, relying on these definitions to, to say, when do we have safety? When can we safety plan? And when should children be, be put in foster care? Next slide. The, the final component was really just increasing leadership support and oversight. So how we can support staff in these very, very difficult situations so that when we're look, working with a family and we know that not everything is black and white, um, that the situations are often gray, how we can provide additional guidance and support to social workers so those very tough decisions don't rely, don't rest on their shoulders alone. Um, also making sure that we have oversight on what the data looks like. Um, much of the data that we have in child welfare has been focused on foster care. So as we build out a more prevention continuum, we've had to be creative with how we're tracking the impact, how we're looking at success. And that's something that we're still continuing to do. Next, I'm gonna turn it over to Hillary and I think she'll go through a, a case scenario that's really gonna drive home what this practice looks like, what it previously looked like and what it looks like now. Yes, thank you. Um, as Daniel mentioned, um, I, I supervise the team that goes to court on all the dependency cases. Um, and then also, which is really important for um, our ability to look at this fabulous work um, happen, is that we advise on all the um, proposed removals and the petitions to the court. So we've really seen this on the case by case basis unfold, which has been uh, really a, a beautiful thing for us. Um, so we came up with five common scenarios. In the interest of time, I'm going to highlight the most common. Um, so uh, that's the next slide. 
Uh, so um, we, we often, the, the, uh, the great majority of cases that come before the court are um, because a parent has a substance abuse disorder. That's, that's a vast majority. Um, and historically, if a parent had a substance abuse disorder that was affecting their ability to safely care for their child, we would see that child um, removed from the family, placed in foster care, and then we would petition the court, and then there would be an effort to reunify the child with the parent over a period of time. Now what we're seeing over the last 18 months to two years is that the social worker, when they get that referral about the parent's substance abuse, is immediately um, engaging the family and all the family's natural supports. So both relatives and community members and anybody who cares about that family and that child, getting them together for one of these child and family team meetings and talking about how can we keep this child safe. Um, and we're seeing um, sort of the parent agrees to go to the house on the hill, um, a substance abuse treatment program with the child in their care, or the grandparent says, well, I can move into the home, or I can take the child for a while while the parent goes into recovery. Um, and so a lot of those uh, meetings are resulting in plans that are family-based plans that prevent the child for the need to ever come into um, protective custody or into foster care. It's been really exciting to see. And last but not least, I think, you know, the, the work that we're doing around developing safety plans, um, working with families early on, relies on a very robust prevention continuum. So these are an example of some of the things that we've built out. Um, as my staff are working with families and creating safety plans, they need to be able to have tools and resources to offer those families to help um, meet those needs. So, you know, the work of Neighbor to Neighbor, which is transitioning over to a program called SAFE, um, Mockingbird, which is a kind of a nationally known a uh, respite care program for foster foster parents. We actually have agreed with the Mockingbird uh, organization to pilot that to support biological parents as well. First call for families to give that uh, legal support and advice to families uh, before they go to the dependency court. Uh, things like flexible funding. These are all things to help get resources up front before we have to make that decision to remove a child. Um, I can't underscore enough how much the you know that initial decision can have kind of long lasting uh, impacts on the, the health and well being of that child, very similar to what you may hear from ACEs. So it's very important that we make sure that that if we're going to make a decision like that, it's the it's the last option available. Um, and, and we're going to exhaust all of these prevention services first. Next slide. And I think I'll just end by saying, um, you know, I, I'm just incredibly proud um, of the work that has happened within, I think, DFCS, but as well as in partnership with Hillary and her team. Um, and it really is, I think, um, groundbreaking in the world of child welfare to kind of reimagine how we engage families to this level um, and to see the outcomes that we've seen. Um, we're starting to get interest from other uh, partner counties and other national organizations to kind of really dig in to see how, how we've been able to make this shift. Um, it, it's really been, um, you know, with the work of our social workers on the front end, um, and the partnership that we have with the county council having this shared mission and understanding of the, the value and the importance of that connection of that child and their family within their community. So with that, I'll, I'll end and turn it over for any questions. Thank you both, Hillary and, and Daniel. Thank you. I'm going to see if there are any comments from the public. I see no hands raised, so I'm going to close the public hearing component and come back to the board. Um, Supervisor Allenberg, do you want to start? I, I don't have any any questions. I'm kind of in awe of this. It, it seems like such a radical and yet obvious and deeply needed shift in in focus. And um, I'm really proud that that our county is is doing the work. So thank you, Dan. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you to all of you for for really centering children and families in this system and i i just think it's it's a great model that we should be thinking about with whatever population we're trying to serve in whatever context is, is center the people that are being directly impacted in the work so just thank you thank you supervisor thank you i i am um, i'm very interested in in understanding how our partners are digesting this and how we and how, how we think about um, the research that will determine our effectiveness or success. And what I'm, what I'm interested in, and I'm sure you all are getting this feedback too, is that 
there's a little bit of a buzz of a concern that um, the way I've heard it described is, is just a concern ab about child uh, safety and well-being, which I know is, the, is at the center of what we're trying to resolve. But I'm wondering if you all internally have been thinking about how we measure that success in, in very quantifiable ways, long-term. Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. And I think part of this is we have some existing federal measures that, that look at kind of repeat maltreatment. That's gonna be something that we're monitoring very, very closely. Some of this goes to the broader prevention work in that, again, the, the data that is readily available to like a child welfare system has historically been focused on a removal. So it's almost all centered on foster care. So we're really having to reinvent and recreate what those dashboards look like. The One of the items that was on the agenda today, the um, um, prevention to out of home is kind of one of our first attempts to kind of combine those two things together. Historically, we would have just had a foster care report. We really wanna look at the at the full continuum from, our, from any kind of contact from prevention um, all the way to foster care. Um, Hillary and I have also done a lot of work um, and presented the same kind of very similar presentation to both internal as well as external stakeholders um, to get input. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's opportunities and we've seen it with some of our kind of CBO partners to really look at how, how their work potentially can shift from a, a focus on an out-of-home piece to a focus on in-home. Uh, finally, I'll just say too that um, if we ever have a situation where, where our uh, assessment has identified a safety threat, um, and we can show that there's really no way to safety plan around that, then, then a removal is going to have to happen in that sense. Um, what we want to try to offer is if, if our staff ever feel like um, they're not able to do a decision that, that they feel like they would have done in the past, then they're, they're welcome. They pull in uh, their managers or even the execs. Because um, if we get to that point and we have to make a decision, I want that to, you know residing with, with one of my team. Um, instead of residing with that that individual social worker, kind of carry that burden. So, um, a lot of work still to do to develop about the full kind of um, CQI model for how we're measuring mm -hmm. this. Because um, the other piece is, is how do you measure something that potentially didn't happen? Um, that's all stuff that we're really working on, and I think working on with some of our partners. Yeah, and and I think um, the other question really is if if we are really rethinking the role that we have. Um, with children and families, then the question really is, for me, is who do we consider part of our case load? Our, our, who are we providing support to? And how are the gates opened more widely for earlier intervention before somebody hits a, a, a certain level of trigger? And one example is that, um, I'll just use medical care. I was talking to a, a colleague and we were talking a little bit about how to make sure that young people had access to preventative services for mental health. And one program only accepted uh, children and the insurance aligned with this who had a failed attempt at taking their own life at suicide. And if you think about the logic in that is crazy, right? That you survive suicide in order to get help. And, and I feel often in our attempt to be both fair and, and share resources appropriately, that we have gates that impact service that then impact outcomes, sometimes more dramatically than we intend. And so one thing I would wanna understand is when we're thinking about the, the clients that are within our responsibility, um, who are they? And what is it that we're um, going to be uh, investing in those families? As an example, um, you know, one thing that, that I, I've never looked at, but it would be interesting to know is, um, you know, how, I mean, it's not interesting. I mean, it's, it's object an objective way we look at things, which is, you know, Hillary pointed out that the number one um, challenge we have with families that end up in our system is that we have a, a, an addiction of some sort, right? Drugs or alcohol that, that are so severe that the family can't um, stabilize. And what that often means is you have families that don't have 
rich networks of resources within the immediate sphere of that family, right? Otherwise, you would have intervention already occurring. Mm -hmm. That was that was, um, you know, an appropriate high enough level. All that is to say that one of the concerns I've had is that in our foster care system, even when we developed programs like Intern and Earn, we were arguing over what made a child eligible. If they were ever in foster care, they had to currently be in foster care. And so I'm wondering if there is a way for us to designate um, families that allow us to make appropriate levels of investment outside of that particular system. And that's part of the reason I was so interested in the in doing that intervention program that I'm, I'm glad we we moved on. But I, I think that that component of it needs to be dramatically expanded. Otherwise, I think we won't catch the, the um, we will restructure a system around, I'm worried about how the system's gonna get restructured around the new approach is, is probably the clearest way I can say it. And I think that impacts who we think are within our purview of responsibility. And I think that therefore impacts um, the way we do program design in the first place. And then what underscores all of that is if somebody had a neighbor to neighbor visit, like a nonprofit partner went to see them and they that family um, thrives, then the other question for us would be, why does one family thrive with minimum intervention? Why do other families not? That's that's the other piece I wanna understand because if we use the benchmarks for, for children who are foster youth, we know, we know what the graduation rate is approximately, we know what the homelessness rate is, we know what the, the um, population, the percentage that get engaged in the criminal justice system. We need to understand all of that for the children who don't end up in the system because we have to be able to determine whether or not what we're doing is actually helpful. Because what I also worry about is that if we're not, if our eye isn't on those children and we still see an increase in homeless, I mean, a, a, some number of children who become homeless are kicked out when they're 18, because that could happen in a foster home or a non-foster home, right? Does that make sense? It, it does. And I, and, you know, I think from, from the, the role that um, like, a, like a child welfare like DFCS has, one of our goals has been to kind of decouple services from the dependency system as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, to make services that, that we've seen be beneficial to the families we serve in foster care be, be available as much as possible to non-foster care youth. I think, um, you know, the, the each county is doing a Families First Prevention Services Prevention Plan, a comprehensive prevention plan. That'll capture a little bit of this. Our plan is due to the yeah. state next July. Um, so you should be hearing more about that next spring. Um, we have a children's continuum. Um, it's called AB 2083. That's something that the state required every county to do. Um, so that's where we have child welfare, juvenile uh, uh, probation, public health, um, behavioral health, county office of ed, all the key partners that, that discuss coordinative care for youth, um, specifically kind of in foster care, but we've expanded that. Um, the last thing I'll add though, is that um, I've had, we've had a very good partnership with Sarah Duffy and the Office of Children and Families Policy. And I think that's where a lot of this is, you're gonna start seeing overlap and crossover. So um, we're supporting one another in this as we, we're building out um, we don't. We want to make sure we're not building out of two parallel systems. That we're building out a, a full continuum that really goes from full prevention, not system involved, all the way through to somebody who's with um, DFCS or juvenile probation. That's really great. I mean, I I think um, you know I was going to ask about Sarah next, and um, I, I one of the one of the um, approaches I'm better trying to understand is how how we provide a, a you know a, a a safe floor um and then build from that so that the you know that that all of our partners really are engaged in the same way and really supporting the development of children and families in our community and then what sliver we take as the ones that need more support and I, um, so I appreciate the discussion. I'll give, I'll give more thought to it too, because this is something I've been thinking about for a while and I'm really excited to hear the, the work that you're doing. And also wanna, wanna just say out loud that I, I do think um, in the next six months to a year, there is value to us bringing together our partners who are still a little skeptical to let them um, talk to us about what their concerns are and and um, 
and the program will be a little more fleshed out. And the reason I was asking the evaluation questions is I think that would help me understand how we can share the um, in, in more concrete terms in ways that we all agree that that the direction we're going has value because of X, Y, and Z, you know? So yeah, anyway, that, yeah, I, I think this is really very exciting. Very, very exciting. Um, but I also wanna make sure we're keeping children safe and that our partners believe that we're doing the same thing. And I, I'm just feeling like we're at this interesting inflot or a, this inflection point where where we're either helping people see where we're going or not. and. And that's really where I want to make sure we capture our, our, the thoughts of all of the program partners as soon as we can. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you for the good work and the report. And um, I'm looking forward to learning more and appreciate all the leadership. And please share it with the frontline staff. I, I can't imagine how difficult and all the changes that are going on in their programming, but we really do appreciate their leadership on this. Absolutely. So with that, just look for a quick minute. I don't know. Um, there's really no action. We're just receiving the report. So we'll, we'll move on to our next item and say thank you to the staff for that. Um, and the next is item 18. And this is child care for county employees. Good afternoon, Chairperson Chavez and Vice Chairperson Ellenberg, John Mills, Employee Services Agency Director. Um, as the committee will recall, just by way of background on the Employee Child Care Assistance Pilot Program, the county opened an initial enrollment period for the 2022 calendar year back in May. And following that initial enrollment period, administration made a recommendation to the board to coincide the Employee Child Care Assistance Program with the county's existing dependent care assistance program so that employees who participated in the child care assistance program could get a county funded child care benefit that would be tax free to the employee. As part of those changes to the program, we also um, changed some of the eligibility requirements that had been in the initial iteration back in May, including changing the income threshold to just be based on the employee salary as opposed to the adjusted gross income for the household. Um, we also added that eligible expenses could include before and after school care as well as in-home providers. And we also increased the dependent eligibility age from under six years old in the May program to under 13 years old in the most recent iteration. And so the board may recall, um, the committee may, may recall that we received authorization to make all these changes in early October. And so we had to scramble rather quickly to get the word out about the changes and have uh, an initial enrollment period for the 2023 calendar year that preceded then the flexible spending account open enrollment period of November, which is when the dependent care assistance program enrollment takes place. And so what we provided in the legislative file that's attached to this item is the final enrollment numbers that we received from the county's third party administrator earlier this month. Um, as you may know, the flexible spending account open enrollment period closed on November 30th. And so we were able to receive these final enrollment numbers from the third party administrator a couple of weeks ago and set up accounts for these employees to begin receiving payments um, for the 2023 benefit year. And so with that, um, I think that's all, all I have to present at this time. I will add though, that since the this sort of second iteration of the pilot program just concluded, we still, um, intends to undertake a sort of lessons learned analysis of how this second iteration of the pilot program went with incorporating the employee child care assistance program into the DCAP benefit and, you know, intend to have some improvements to how that rolls out for the next FSA enrollment period um, 
next year. So with that, I'm available to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you. I'm going to first go to the public and see if there are any comments. Uh, seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing and move to our discussion. And I'll start with Supervisor Ellenberg. Thank you. And thank you, John, for getting this, this program up and running. Uh, I appreciate that you, you recognized um, some of the challenges with, with employees hearing very late, um, either not being informed or misinformed about their status right before the DCAP um, open enrollment deadline. So thank you for already thinking about iteration there and, and how we might um, make sure that the opportunity is broadly available uh, to folks in a way that they can, can use it. I am pleased, having said that, um, with how many employees did sign up uh, for next year. Um, the board approved uh, up to $2 million for the ECAP benefit. And the chart shows that we're looking uh, for 2023 at about 1.2 million. Um, additionally, knowing that uh, there are likely wait lists for people looking for childcare, employees may not actually put in for reimbursement uh, that they've been approved for, um, but don't yet have the child care. What happens, so first of all, that's a separate plug for, it, it's not enough to have the financial benefit. We still need to have the access and the facilities and, and all of those pieces. Uh, but what happens to the remaining and the unspent funds for ECAP? Does, does it roll over? That's an excellent question, Supervisor Ellenberg. And you know, my understanding from a budget perspective is that this um, question could and should be posed to the board in terms of, you know, whether they want those funds to roll over into the program for the um, the next enrollment period. Um, and then sort of, you know, to what level the next enrollment period would be funded. And I think that that would likely come either as part of the mid-year adjustments, the board could make its its pleasure known at that time, or as certainly as part of the FY24 budget process. Thanks, That that's helpful. As the program <coughs> ramps up, I feel like, you know, we're clearly still in such a new phase that it's, it's too soon to make some general estimate of, of how much we'll spend each year. And of course there could be baby boom years and um, and years with, with fewer children. So I would like to make sure that there is some placeholder um, money every year. And then once we, we really know what the amount is, then we won't, um, we won't have to worry so much about whether we're estimating high or low. So, Thank you, I appreciate that. And it should come to us um, for consideration in the mid-year adjustments. And, and changes, sorry, let me just make sure that makes sense. Is there one annual enrollment period or two semi? So the idea going forward is that there will be one annual enrollment period that will coincide with the FSA, the flexible spending accounts, open enrollment period in November and that so that employees can fold the child care assistance program benefit into the dependent care assistance program and realize the tax-free nature of the county's funds. Okay, great. Thanks, John. You're welcome. So, um, so just to make sure I understand this, we haven't turned anyone away because we've run out of funds. Correct. Okay. So anybody who was denied was denied for another reason. Yes, that's my understanding. Yes. And with the denials, do we have a, you know, a summary of the reasons for denial? We can get that information um, if that's of interest to the committee. I know that the third party administrator, you know, had pulled together just the finalized enrollment numbers for us so that we could have them to present in this legislative file. But we can also get from them um, essentially a breakdown, uh, sort of a categorization of reasons for denial of the employees who, who weren't deemed um, eligible for the program. 
I think that would be great um, because I think we need to look at if, if, if it's money, if it's financial, if it's, I mean, all of that, I, th I think we really just want to know the answer to those, those questions. Um, the other, the other thing that, so here's what I'm concerned about. And I, I know we sent you a, an email, but for the record and Susan, for you, I, I just wanted you to know, um, and recognizing what you said, John, just about when the timeline that we started under and, and then trying to run against that timeline, because what I would really like to see is a much more robust um, timeline that, that fits into the, the tax implications and the financial implications. And, and I haven't yet seen that. So I don't know that we said, oh, we've learned from this and now we're gonna do it this other way. So I'd, I'd really like to see that come back to this committee with, um, with, so that we can address the timeliness of notices, the confusion about the income eligibility requirements, and I'm gonna ask you a little bit about that, the lack of verification for eligibility, and the lack of one clear point of contact. Like I don't, I don't really know, and, and, and maybe you can answer this too about, we have a third party administrator because we thought that would be faster than us doing it in-house. Yes, um, and, and this third party administrator um, has experience. Um, it's actually our flexible spending accounts um, plan, our FSA plan administrator. And so we wanted to use them to have an independent third party make the eligibility determinations as opposed to having the county make the eligibility determinations. But, but if the eligibility requirements are objective, then it shouldn't matter who does that. And I'm only saying this because if, if the third party administrator isn't able to perform to the same level that you think your internal staff would be, I'm open to that discussion because if it's objective, it's objective. And if it's not objective, that's an issue. The other thing is, is that if we're seeing trends, I presume your staff would catch the trends faster than somebody who's not working in the trenches. So I, I'm gonna- Absolutely, yeah, yeah. no, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I think all of the issues that you are raising in terms of the performance of the third party administrator, um, you know, timeliness of notices, the verification of eligibility, these are all things that we intend to go back and sort of, um, you know, have kind of an after action sort of uh, debrief on how it all went and see how for the next iteration of the program, we can make improvements to all these areas. Like you mentioned, the point of contact, who is the best point of contact? You know, we, we tried it initially, um, having the third party administrator be the point of contact, but that didn't work out as well as we might have liked. So I think there, there are a number of issues that um, we've identified and that you you raised here, Supervisor, that we um, want to review as part of our sort of after, after action planning. And we'd be happy to sort of bring our thoughts on those things back to this committee and have a conversation about um, the next iteration of the program and, and what, how we intend to address some of the issues raised. That would be great. I'm gonna then just, again, give a couple of other pieces of feedback. So the administrator, um, the third party, you know, part of the reason I'm raising this is that our employees, um, one other question. I, I'm curious about how many people stopped filling out the form and why, um, because I wanna make sure we're not asking people to verify things that are that you all have the information for. I just think that would be, unnecessary and the goal is to make it easy and not stressful and easy for a family to figure out which option they should pick. So, um, you know, we got feedback that some of the employees were notified only if, only um, a few days before or after the dependent care assistance program deadline. Um, and we know there are tax implications for this program and so what we want to make sure again the timeline addresses that you know that issue so people can make decisions that are good for their families financially um, and then there's the issue of what scale is being used um, our county materials stated that to be eligible for the employer-funded ecap program you must be a full-time employee 
have an annual individual adjusted gross income of $119,000 or less, have a dependent child or children under the age of 13 or other eligible dependent, and have an eligible dependent care to have and eligible dependent care expenses such as after school daycare or qual qualifying in home care. Um, this is some, but based on this assumption is, is that the adjusted gross income would be used. However, my staff was informed that the gross salary scale was being used. So I'm, I'm just right now, what I wanna know is what are we using? We are using gross salary and that was one of the um, simplifications that we made to the eligibility requirements for the second iteration of the program. Um, it was a change from the May iteration of the program. The May iteration, we actually required employees to submit tax forms because the um, eligibility, the income eligibility was based on household adjusted gross income. And so we wanted to change that for the fall iteration of the program so that it would simply be based upon the employee's salary. And to your point about not having to make employees submit information that we already had, the criteria that we used was the employee's um, salary based on their job classification, which we already have. And so that, and we only looked at the salary of the individual employee, not at the income of their entire household. Mm -hmm. So in January, I, what I'd like to just have is have you come back to this committee with remedies for the issues that we just raised. Um, and, I, and I'm really interested in the timeline for when we're asking people for information because I recognize we're moving fast and, but no buts, we're moving fast. I, I wanna get this resolved. It, and the other reason is to Susan's point, it's hard to know how much money to set aside if the if we've constrained it so much or we want to open it up a little bit more and how to do that based on the information that we have now. And then the other is, I just do want to say, um, I think it's really important that that the that there be a justification for the the gross salary versus adjusted that so that we can understand what the tax implications are and why the what the choices may be for people um you know and and also if there's if we require more funding that we build it in because what i don't want to do is get people really excited about a program and then tell them they can't access it because of funding um, once we figure out the details of what the need is um, and the reason I'm, I'm hesitating a little bit, like part of me just says we should be using the adjusted gross income, but I, I, I'm really, I really want to make sure that we're not impacting the, the tax exempts nature of the, of the benefit. So I'd like that to also be, you know, something that, I, something in writing that explains the choice and how this is better for the employees relative to, to their taxes. I'm sorry that wasn't less confusing, John. Did you understand what I was? No, I, I I I was tracking okay. with with your comments. So thank you. I appreciate that. And, and and yes, and just um, you know, just as you mentioned, yes, we were moving quite fast. And um, from the time that sort of the board authorized these changes in early October, you know, we we didn't have a a very um long window of time to engage employees about the new benefit and then lead into the November FSA open enrollment period, which is fixed. But certainly this coming year, we can start that period of engagement much earlier um, in terms of, you know, outreaching to employees, explaining the criteria, having them engage with us and the third party administrator on you know, whatever information needs to be submitted so that we can catch anything that may be off um, prior to the open enrollment period commencing on November 1st. That's helpful, thank you. Absolutely. Um, Susan, was that clear to you too? Sorry, I took us down a mulberry bush, around the mulberry bush, but I was trying to respond to all the queries we got in the office. No, I, I appreciate it a lot. 
All right. So with that, why don't we just make uh, take a, an action um, so that we can have this come back in January with the list of remedies that we're going to resolve and then resolve the issue about adjusted or um, gross income and just I, identify the opportunities and risks for both. And then, you know, and then I, I would like a little phrase or sentence about the third party administrator versus us. There, there may be a lot of benefits to it. I just, I would just be interested, John, in getting your feedback based on the, from my perspective, sort of the lack of communication and frankly, your office not having the expertise to respond to people, which is why I think people were getting different information um, and not knowing where to send people. Yeah, I'll second that motion. Great. So we have a motion and a second, and I'll ask the staff to call the roll. Vice Chairperson Ellenberg? Yes. And Chairperson Chavez? Yes, thank you. Thank you, John. All right, now we're going to go on to, let me just check my uh, item 19, the Office of Children and Families Pol Family Policy. Sarah, you're on mute if you're speaking. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, Chair Chavez, Vice Chair Ellenberg. Uh, Sarah Duffy, Chief Children's Officer, very pleased to provide a status report from our office this afternoon. Given the length of the legislative report, the presentation is going to focus on updates on priority initiatives that you can see bolded on this slide. Um, so I will cover updates on the three initiatives to increase early care and education workforce and the youth task force. And then our consultant, Amy Reedy, will cover the wellness center study and facilities and fleet will provide an update regarding policy considerations for child care on county facilities. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, on this slide, you can see the three workforce initiatives. Um, first five was contracted to work with early learning stakeholders to develop and implement a three-pronged strategy to strengthen the early learning and care workforce serving children from infancy through five years through apprenticeships, transitional kindergarten equity, and a shared services alliance. Two apprentice cohorts were launched in September. One focused on state preschool centers, and that includes 24 apprentices uh, and the other is focused on family child care and includes 27 apprentices. Apprentices receive early learning coursework through Mission and De Anza Colleges, and early learning so far indicate the need for a mentor community of practice, and this was implemented with facilitation support from the County Office of Education's Inclusion Collab Collaborative. With regard to TK Equity, an early learning co consortium composed of early learning stakeholders launched in October of this year, this consortium will identify pathways to preschool to a third grade credential pending straight state credential guidelines. To begin understanding interest in a P3 uh, through three credential and identifying pathways, an interest form resulted in 159 um, early learning candidates. First five is applying an equity framework to select a diverse TK equity cohort. The consortium will identify and find solutions for barriers that may impede participation in a credentialed program that results in a more diverse workforce. And the third initiative is the Shared Services Alliance, and this sets out to build infrastructure support to small business, family, child care, home providers, and to anchor equity into design of the framework. Informational sessions have been held in English and Spanish and resulted in 66 interested family care providers. Of these, 40 were invited to form a design team and 32 were accepted, or 32 accepted the offer. All applicants will be invited to participate in other ways, such as informational sessions or participating in local family child care conference. Design teams will lead efforts to identify key business supports for family child care home providers. So that's that update, and I'll move on briefly to the youth task force transition. On September 13th, a board referral from Supervisor Ellenberg was approved to move the Youth Task Force staff duties from the Office of Supervisor Ellenberg to Office of Children and Families Policy, and since then our office has been working on the logistics for a successful transition. On December 13th, staff from our office and County Council attended the Youth Task Force meeting to provide an overview of our office, introduce staff that uh, will represent our office and support the Youth Task Force, 
and to discuss recommended changes to the bylaws associated with the transition to the Office of Children and Family Policy. The Youth Task Force voted in favor of updating the bylaws, which have been, had actually not been updated since 2018. The updated bylaws are scheduled for review and approval at the January 10th Board of Supervisors um, meeting. Next slide, please. So with this slide, I'll actually introduce Amy Reedy, who is our consultant working on the School-Based Behavioral Health Wellness Center study, and she will provide an update of the project. Thank you, Sarah. Can everyone hear me? Yes, Amy, we can. Okay, great. Good afternoon, Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Ellenberg. Um, for the past three months, um, I've been working with uh, the county team uh, on a wellness center study that will inform a uh, eventual operational plan. Um, next slide, please. The purpose of the, the study is to provide information to develop re recommendations for the potential expansion of school-based behavioral health wellness centers in Santa Clara County which will then be detailed in an operational plan. The study has encompassed five key components starting at the top of this um, diagram. First, the, we have um, uh, conducted a survey with 15 school districts that were identified by the county team. Second, uh, we've incorporated and are continuing to incorporate wellness center information that's being collected through the Student Behavioral Health Improvement Program Needs Assessment, which has been going on during the same time period. Third, um, we've conducted a review of best practices and wellness center approaches across 10 California counties, including the, all the Bay Area counties. Fourth, um, we have gathered input from key stakeholders, including the County Office of Education, the City of San Jose, and community-based organizations. And then finally, we've worked to identify potential funding sources for wellness centers, um, both that are currently being used, but also are, could be aligned within the health, education, and social service arenas. The study builds on an assessment and report on school-based behavioral health services that was conducted by RDA and Behavioral Health in October of 2020. And it will incorporate existing investments in school-based behavioral health services, including school link services and the, uh, the wellness centers that are being funded through the Mental Health Student Services Act. Next slide, please. In addition to the study, the wellness center uh, recommendations and the operational plan will consider and be informed by other key assessments and planning efforts underway in the county. Three key related efforts um, include the, the SBHIP or Student Behavioral Health Incentive Program, which provides incentives to increase coordination among Medi-Cal managed care plans, uh, local education agencies and county mental health. Uh, the program allows for accelerated interventions and in Santa Clara County wellness centers have been identified as one of those early interventions to implement. The Mental Health Services Act planning, as I'm sure you are aware, is underway and recommendations that are aligned with the wellness centers will also be incorporated into the operational plan. And as the Family First Prevention Services Program continues with its planning, um, we will consider how those recommendations align with the wellness centers and the operational plan. Next um, slide, thank you. Although the wellness uh, study center study is not yet finalized, we are able to share the potential scope of recommendations that are forthcoming. All recommendations will take into account existing efforts related to wellness centers in order to maximize resources, prevent duplication of effort, and recognize the existing organizational roles involved in wellness centers. Uh, we anticipate recommendations that support establishing new wellness centers, and this will include prioritization criteria, uh, course staffing and services, and um, aligned county programs. 
The recommendations may also include support for infrastructure needs. And examples here could include managed care billing capacity, systems for service coordination and evaluation of wellness centers, and professional development as examples. The operational plan will also um, align available county funding and identify other potential sources of funding. There's quite a bit of state funding that's um, been available and will continue to be available over the next couple of years that could be considered for wellness centers. Finally, um, collaboration is critical to any wellness center and to, um, and to a countywide effort to implement uh, wellness centers across districts and schools. And so we anticipate there'll be recommendations in this area as well. Next slide, please. So our next steps are to complete the study um, and um, specifically incorporating the SB HIP needs assessment information, which that report is um, being finalized this month. Um, and then we are developing recommendations. We will have a detailed operational plan. That plan will have aligned funding sources um, and then report back to the Children's, Seniors, and Families Committee by March of 2023. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you, Amy. So I'll um, turn it over now to Dave Berry, Chief of Facilities Planning from Facilities and Fleet, who will provide the final portion of our report out today with an update on policy considerations uh, for feasibility of infant and toddler childcare at county facilities. Good afternoon, Dave Barry here. So basically what we're looking at is a similar process whenever FAF uh, is looking at designing or planning, designing and constructing facilities. But instead of um, our client being county departments, it would be uh, specifically in this case, uh, interested childcare operators um, with the assistance of um, designers familiar with this type of uh, Type of facility, whether it's for owned or leased facilities. And with that, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Dave. So that, that concludes our, um, our report out this afternoon. We're, we're happy to answer any questions. In addition to Dave and Amy, we also have um, representatives from Behavioral Health and First Live who are available if you have questions in those areas. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to see if there are any public speakers on this item. I see none. So I'm going to turn it over to Supervisor Umber because her mic came off so quick. I'll come out. I'll go after you. <laughs> Happy either way. Thank you, Sarah, and, and the whole team for, for the update and the progress on, on so many uh, of the office's priorities. Um, starting with the the wellness center can you confirm that the plan is to bring this item back to cfsc in march and then to the full board in april uh yes i can answer that that's the plan um hopefully if we'll, we'll have to move quickly between um march and april but that's the the anticipated timeline yes thanks so much i want to um just make a couple of uh, comments in both of the, those reports I want to see that the operational plan that's developed from the study assumes a launch of new services for the start of the 23-24 school year and places wellness center expansion in the context of other county health plan, county office of ed, and school district supported youth wellness efforts, including school link services, ALCOV, uh, SB HIP, uh, and any other efforts so that we're really maximizing the impact of the wellness centers and that our resources are intentionally linked together uh, rather than duplicative in the in the landscape of child and youth services. Any questions about that, Sarah, or that's clear? That's clear. And we've been looking at all those resources. So that makes sense and is part of the considerations. Terrific. Thank you. Um, and with regard to the Shared Services Alliance, uh, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Uh, have you been able to engage either you or First Five um, with chambers of commerce or business associations to bring them in to help with professional development and small business supports? 
Heidi, do you want to answer that or, or Buckley? Sure. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I can start and then I'll hand it over to Buckley. Um, we find that uh, business supports are critical to creating the Shared Service Alliance, and we've already begun those business partnerships through our apprenticeship effort as well, through the City of Milpitas Economic Development Department. And um, there is a real synergetic opportunity to um, leverage funding together to improve workforce, in particular tapping into ARPA dollars and figuring out how we can um, get the economy back up and running from the pandemic uh, by partnering with cities and economic development offices for all of our workforce initiatives. But in particular, uh, shared services will be a great opportunity for these micro-owned businesses uh, that are family child care providers, particularly owned by women, often um, women of color, Black, Indigenous women of color. Buckley, so, did you want to add anything else? Because Buckley is actually the lead on the Shared Services Alliance project. Thanks, Heidi. And hi, Buckley. Hello. Um, yeah, I, Heidi, I think you you said it, but I think the process, the part we're at right now in the process is um, building the design team, and we're going to be collecting what the top needs are. So maybe folks want to do a child care management system automated. Maybe they want to focus on marketing first or tax support. So we're going to kind of locate the needs first of the whole kind of provider community. And then my hope too is from there, we can really strengthen the connections we've already started. So that's that's the goal, definitely. So Buckley, thank you for shifting that um, perspective for me because I, I had been thinking about their engagement first to provide the providers um, with technical or financial support, but but certainly it makes more sense to find out what people's needs are and then go out and find the right partners uh, to meet those needs. I, I heard Heidi, um, you mentioned Milpitas, which I know has been their economic development department has been a great partner from the beginning of the apprenticeship program. Um, of course, other, other cities with workforce development, hopefully we can build, but I was asking specifically about um, business associations or, or chambers, kind of peer groups uh, for these providers, but I'm now thinking that because of the way Buckley responded to the question is that it's a little bit premature and you want to find the needs first. Is that is that correct? Absolutely. Two things to think about um, for us. One is that um, connecting with those chambers is also, it's also helpful to have contacts at the economic development offices at the cities because they are more connected than we tend to be. So we're really bridging um, two different industries together. And so any kind of bridge that we can um, utilize, we will. Um, secondly, part of the Shared Services Alliance is to create a conference for family child care home providers in our area. And they will be figuring out what sorts of presentations they might want at this conference, who to invite to the conference, anyone who's interested in helping to support the family child care community. And I think we'll be partnering uh, with De Anza as well on this so that um, we're really looking at a comprehensive approach to connecting these small business owners with business supports. Good, and and so I'll, you know, just to, to really put a, a fine point on it, uh, we're working to shift the narrative around childcare and we need um, businesses, we need the private sector, government is, is a, an incremental step ahead, but we need the private sector to understand how critical affordable accessible childcare is right now to family economic stability, to income, uh, to put into the, into the consumer economy, uh, tax revenue, um, you know, more higher productivity for employers. I think that is a piece that we really have to be visible and vocal about and having a presence in those business associations gives, um, gives providers and their advocates an opportunity to just continue um, to make that case because this is about 
primarily children's wellness, but by no means only uh, about children and children's development. So thank you for, for all of that. I'm gonna turn um, to, I think it was Dave um, Barry on the facilities report. Uh, thank you for that. I'm really eager to, to see the progress and identification for next steps. The ledge file indicates that you're planning to return to CFSC in the spring of 2023 with an analysis of demand and, and the map to inform any next steps related to recommendations uh, for potential child uh, county child care space policy. Happy to keep that report here. Uh, I'm sure Supervisor Chavez wants it, but I want to also request that that come to FGOC and then to the full board for adoption of the of the policy. Um, and just thinking about, but you know, we're, we're starting with with our facilities, but I'd encourage you also to think about the child care facilities that closed during the pandemic. Are there opportunities? there to reactivate spaces, um, certainly spaces that are already built out and have been previously licensed, will help us move uh, a lot faster than, than building out our own. And I just want to make sure that we are really thinking very creatively and broadly about all of the opportunities. And, and I would say the same for that matter for, for home-based care that, that closed. If, if providers are still willing to you know to reopen with support we we ought to be thinking about that too um and then finally and i i think this is possible through the the joint child care committee i know i'm mixing uh groups here um supervisor chavez and i have both requested information uh, on those facilities that closed uh during covid um so I, so there might already be work going on there. If that is the case, fantastic. I'd love that to be included uh, with the next report. If it's not already being considered, please add it in uh, so that it is part of the next report as well. And, and I'll make that a motion. Thank you. We have a motion and I will second it. Um, I just, first of all, um, team, there's a lot of really great work happening. And so I wanted to just acknowledge that and say, thank you. This is absolutely an exciting and right direction. A um, couple of things that I, I want to make sure that we're, um, that when we get our report backs um, through the committee that, um, that we're really taking a look at the sustainability of each of the programs that we're putting forward. And part of the reason I'm mentioning that is that I, I was out uh, talking, actually, Susan, at one of the events, you and I were out just having a conversation about the impacts, for example, that TK is having on um, on child based availability, yeah. right? And then, and then yeah. it made me wonder a little bit about the viability of emerging businesses in that area if they're now competing with TK, and that's an age that is a little less expensive than than littles, you know, than really than you know, children that aren't potty trained and all that. So I I'm very interested in the sustainability of of each of the investments that we're making and if there are other sources of funds that we should be looking at. Um, so that's that's kind of one big bucket. And the second is that I really just want to reinforce Susan what you said about how um, we're weaving in the the supportive families, childcare in particular, to the whole economic development infrastructure, which we at the county don't have and mostly cities do. And I think there's value in um, us via um, a referral to ask the staff to help us think about the very best way to develop that sort of um, um, at a countywide level more of a a business and economic development framework in terms of the work being done by this committee, both relative to how we could partner with each city's economic development department, since we don't have one per se. Um, but second of all, really to look at what's the path to helping the broader public understand the economic importance of this. We, we understand it from a from a, a health community health perspective, but there really is this much bigger picture. And while these discussions are happening in different parts of the country, they're not happening as much as I would expect them to happen here, right. in particular, given that even with the current um, you know, layoffs within the tech community, we still have such a low um, 
um, uh, unemployment rate. And that and and with that low unemployment rate, we have a whole number of people that are still not able to go back to work because they do not have reliable either child care or family care. So I don't expect us to answer that question today, but I think it would be worth us having at least um, a discussion, uh, Sarah, with you and with the, the team that's working on this to help us think about that. And there may be value in reaching out to the economic development officers of a couple of cities. I, and, you know, we, um, I would recommend, uh, obviously, you know, there, there are many cities that are very, very active in helping their cities think about economic development opportunities in a more education base. One of them that I think would be interesting to talk to would be um, Morgan Hill in particular, I think because Edith Ramirez has been both in the city of San Jose and the city of Morgan Hill. Dave, you know Edith, and I think that she would be a really good ear um, to at least begin the discussions because she could at least at least help us shape it. And Barry, I mean, I'm sorry, David, Barry has played a leadership role in um, in some work on economic development as well as Glenn Williams. So I, I think we have a little bit of, uh, I mean, resources within our own and just having a quick conversation because I, I would like us to have a, a pronged strategy in that area. So I think Susan's right about that. Thanks, and, and maybe it's it's a whole um, intentional special meeting or workshop. I won't be on this committee uh, next year. I'm leaving it in your and Sylvia's very, very capable hands, but this might be something that's of particular broad interest because uh, you know there are studies and information to demonstrate the, the economic effects and the improvements to GDP um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce has this information. There are a number of states. You're right that we are not on the cutting edge here. States um, and cities that are that are figuring out how to provide uh, universal or near universal access to affordable childcare. So, you know, while we're waiting for Elizabeth Warren to get her bill <laughs> passed, let's, do it. let's get going. <laughs> let's see what we can do here. Yeah, Agreed. thank you so much for for all of that. Yeah, good discussion. Yeah, I'll give some thought to that. I, I, I will, and I'll, I'll also maybe offline. Uh, we can just have a discussion about about that particular area because I think there's a lot of value to it. Okay, so we have a motion and we have a second with some additional requests just to do a little outreach. And with that, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. Okay, Vice Chairperson Ellenberg. Yes. And Chairperson Chavez. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all, good work. All right, we're gonna come um, with our verbal report and reports and we're gonna start with Chief Garnett. Is this your last one or your second to last one? Every time I feel like I need to ask you. I know this is my second to the last one. All right, so no crying yet, imagine. go ahead. Okay, um, just a few things to report. Um, we have 19 youth in the secure track. We haven't reported on that in a bit. So we have 19 youth currently staying with us in the secure track. And then we have 12 youth that we're anticipating returning from DJJ um, in June or possibly before between now and June. We currently have 32 in DJJ. We're expecting 12 of them to return to us. The rest would be um, released prior to returning to us. So if you add that up quickly, that's 31 that we'll have by in custody by June. So we're growing quickly and our partners are growing with us. It's, it's going really well. Um, and really fast, which brings me to the second thing. Um, Judge Lucero, and I'm just always gonna call her Judge Lucero, um, <laughs> Director Judge Lucero, um, the head of OICR and her team came and did a, a site visit with, with our team and um, our entire team with uh, uh, behavioral health and everybody for hours and then did a, um, uh, tour that went just super well, really, really well. Our staff just shown um, supervisors and line staff did almost all of it. They talked to the kids. It was it went really, really well. Um, not so well that other counties are going to get really mad at us, though. So I told them to tone it down a little bit. <laughs> um, and then finally, um, this is just amazing. And um, interestingly enough, they were unveiling this as Judge Lucero came in for her visit while they were in the lobby, but we now have a fully functioning Narcan machine in our juvenile probation court lobby that is open to the public and um, to clients and to staff, to anybody can come in and get up to two Narcan kits at a time out of, out of that machine. That's great. 
Thank you, Laura. That's all I have. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, question, Susan? No, thanks very much, uh, Chief Garnett. And I love the position that director Judge uh, Lucero is, is in now. I think it's it continues, she continues to be a great asset for our county as well as, well as the state. Absolutely, absolutely agree. Thank agree. you. Thank you. Um, well, next we'll go to, um, I think, ah, Deborah, there you go. Welcome. You're on mute, Deborah. Sorry about that. Good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Chavez and Vice Chair uh, Ellenberg. It's good to be here with you. Deborah Porsche, Usher, Interim Director for the Social Service Agency. Just a couple of things if I can share with you. Uh, the governor signed recently the, uh, a bill that refines the definition of neglect, which excludes poverty and financial disadvantage, but also emphasizes uh, that signs of risk of physical harm or illness are something that must be in consideration. I think it's really apropos to the discussion you were having earlier with Daniel Little, our Director of uh, Family and Children's Services, uh, related to our prevention, is supportive of that, is reflective of that direction. I also just wanted to add to his wonderful presentation earlier that the evidence-based practices that are required as part of the prevention planning also come with some assessment and evaluative scales. Uh, so to, to your question earlier around how do we evaluate the outcome of that, there are some of those scales that come with some of those tools based upon the evidence-based model that you select. Uh, second, also the federal budget uh, act of 2023, the Consolidation Act, has a couple of implications for us around its SNAP benefits. One, uh, it proposes to end this emergency allotment effective February, 2023. Uh, second, it will reduce the amount of summer benefits that we've seen during the pandemic. However, what it does, it makes that a permanent program year round. And so uh, looking forward to hearing more if should that bill go through. Uh, and, and last but not least, it replaces uh, the SNAP benefits lost to fraud with federal dollars. And that's good for the state because we lost a lot of revenue related to fraud and we're still working with the feds around recouping that. I would also like to share, we continue to do the work with CalSAWS, the implementation team. As you know, CalSAWS is a new statewide system for benefits and so our team is scheduled uh, to implement that in February of this year. And so we met with the statewide team uh, and our own implementation team to really make sure we're all on the same page and we have a smooth transition to CalSAWS. I wasn't here for CalWIN, but I understand it was an interesting experience that no one wants to repeat. <laughs> so <we're, laughs> we are not going to repeat that. Uh, and, Last but not least, I think I just want to just, and I think it's relevant to the conversation that I heard earlier uh, that you had with Daniel Little, please be uh, confident in the fact that behavioral health, probation, and SSI are meeting regularly to really flush out a continuum of services that goes from prevention to early intervention to reunification and to permanency. So we just want to make sure that you're aware that the team is across the board working very hard uh, to make sure that that as in place for our families and to reduce any risk of re maltreatment. So that's it for us. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And I'm open to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Deborah. I'm going to see if there are any questions from Susan. Any questions? No. Deborah, thank you so much. I, and I want to just say how much I appreciate you stepping into that interim spot sort of seamlessly and really appreciate your leadership there. Thank you, it's my honor to do so. Ignacio, our, our director of DCSS, welcome. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to use the opportunity today to talk a little bit just briefly around what some of our work is gonna be focusing on in the upcoming year, uh, not only for us as a department, but also in our engagement with the uh, Child Support Directors Association and the State Department of Child Support Services. Earlier this year, the LAO uh, released their analysis of the governor's budget. 
and really made some key recommendations that I know will work as a work plan for us for the upcoming year in 2023, uh, specifically related to um, potential changes to our funding methodology. Obviously with DCSS funding continues to be a challenge and there's a statewide methodology in which um, Santa Clara County DCSS has unfortunately not received any additional funding. Um, but with some of these potential uh, recommendations and implementations that are coming from the LAO, we may potentially see some in 2023. There are um, five key recommendations. One, uh, the first one being enhancing uh, fiscal incentives for local child support agencies to work uh, more efficiently. That's an area that uh, we have uh, definitely had success in. We've had to uh, from a, a position of need, given the fact that we've had reduced funding and we've looked for innovative and cost efficient ways uh, to work our caseload. So that's one area they're gonna want us to look at as a statewide program and potentially Santa Clara County may come out ahead and that we've done some work ahead of time in this area. Uh, another recommendation is to consider ways to incentivize innovation and cost controls at the county level. Uh, one of the areas of concern has to do with uh, local costs and the difference in cost from one area to another county and how you can stabilize those really statewide. Uh, the third recommendation is a consideration for potential caps around administrative costs. Um, that would obviously be a back and forth discussion between the state and the county to determine how that may impact our future funding. Um, they're also encouraging the state to really uh, demonstrate some leadership in trying to align funding needs based on what they want a desired staffing model to be. Uh, when I first joined DCSS eight years ago, uh, we had well over 300 employees. Now we're down to about 150. So we're uh, basically half of where we were in a period of eight years. And what we're really looking for is what does a, a desired staffing model for our county child support office look like? And how can you maximize that by implementing it statewide and potentially even freeing up some additional funds from other counties to reallocate those among counties that may need it more. And finally, uh, creating an ongoing mechanism to really right size budgets of overfunded county child support agencies. So over the last few years, some counties have received additional funding, but have not been very successful in spending all the money that they've been allocated. While some of uh, some other counties like us would gladly be able to use that money, uh, not only for one-time expenses, but even to help fund additional cost of living increases for our staff. So that's gonna be an item for discussion. And um, that's really what I wanted to discuss today is just give you a preview of some of the work we'll be engaged in in 2023 and see if you had any comments or questions that I could address. Thank you. Susan, did you have any comments or questions? I don't, but thank you, Ignacia. That's a really interesting report. You know, the only thing um, that I, I would be really interested in, Ignacio, and this may be something we wanna agendize for a more robust discussion is your point about the um, staffing model and I, I think is really critical and how counties advocate for that because you're such a weird creature of the state and the and local that um, that I feel like we don't do a good job of advocating. Um, I, I know CSAC does some work on that, but it's it's just a weird design. So in any case, what would be great is if um, if you wouldn't mind talking to my staff about what kinds of questions we should pose, how we agendize that, and then how do we get the board engaged? Because uh, I think this this is kind of a critical time. It's sort of do or die now. Absolutely, uh, we can definitely follow up on that. And I agree with you, I think those are key issues. So uh, we'll make that a priority for the upcoming year as well. Great, thanks Ignacio, appreciate it. All right, um, I think we have one more item on the agenda that I don't think got on consent and that's item 26, unless it did go on consent. Uh, it did, if it is oh, did? the Perfect. work plan, correct. Perfect, I just want, then we are adjourned. I wanna thank Supervisor Ellenberg for her leadership and service on this committee and all of you for the good work you do all year round. And we are adjourned to January 27th at two o'clock. Be well, safe, and have a healthy, happy holiday, everyone. Thank you. Happy New Year, too. Take care, everybody. That's right. Happy New Thank Year. You. Merry Christmas. All the, all the, yes, all the things. All the things. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Hey, this meeting has been adjourned and we will not close this meeting. Thank you all.